The Virginia Cable Telecommunications Association and your local cable provider presents Cable Reports. Join us now as Cable Reports brings you up to date on current issues facing the Commonwealth through discussions with your local legislators and other policymakers from across Virginia. Welcome to a special edition of Cable Reports, brought to you by the Virginia Cable Telecommunications Association, connecting Virginians to their government. I'm Woody Evans, and our special guest today is Secretary of Transportation, Aubrey Lane. Good to see you, sir. Woody, good to see you. Thanks for having me on this snowy day here in the Commonwealth. Yes, absolutely. A lot of things are going on, but I know uh, the administration is trying to focus on uh, improving transportation. Talk to us about what's going on with reference to that effort. You no, know, when we came into office, Governor McAuliffe uh, made clear uh, that with the new monies that were put in under the previous administration, there were some new monies in transportation, first time in 30 years, which sort of renewed our program, at least from a funding standpoint, that we need to make sure that it was uh, we were good fiduciaries and we're really picking the right projects. So, We've spent the last couple of years uh, not only uh, reforming, but refocusing uh, transportation in the Commonwealth. Some legislation, the Governor McCullough's administration have worked with, I can say bipartisan with both and bicameral, uh, with both Republicans, Democrats, House, Senate, uh, where we prioritize projects in the, pro in the Commonwealth now uh, for funding, uh, where we have refocused our um, monies to uh, the revenue streams are now combined with what the real needs are, whether that's maintenance or, or new projects. Uh, we have reformed our Public-Private Partnership Act. We had some good things under that, but a couple things didn't go so well. Um, so uh, we've really worked hard with uh, our uh, partners in the legislative branch and think we've got some good things that will serve the citizens of Virginia very well. Give us an idea of uh, the agency that uh uh, you have jurisdiction over, especially in terms of transportation, the, 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 the number of roads by mile, how we compare to other states? Well, we do. Well, first of all, um, um, there's seven agencies under the, the Secretary of Transportation. Obviously, the largest one of those is the Virginia Department of Transportation, uh, some 7,000 employees just on its own, and it maintains 58,000 center mile lanes. It's the third largest state-maintained network in the, in the country. Uh, we're behind Texas and slightly smaller than North Carolina and that. And of course, uh, when we have events like a snowstorm or anything, uh, there's 58,000 miles of road uh, that we are uh, responsible for. And fortunately, we have a, a very good team here in the Commonwealth of professionals that, that, that do that. But um, that's the largest agency. Of course, uh, we have the Port of Virginia, uh, a spaceport, our Department of Rail and Public Transit, aviation, uh, and our motor D, uh, DMV, our motor vehicle dealer board. So it's a broad range of transportation spectrum, over 10,000 employees, over a $5.5 billion budget. So it uh, keeps me busy. Uh, and uh, and uh, as I said, the Governor McAuliffe has made it clear he wants us to be good fiduciaries and keep us focused. So uh, I spend a lot of time out in the field with these agencies. Now, there was legislation in 2013 setting forth a, a new funding mechanism for transportation. There, there has been legislation since then yeah. tweaking uh, that 2013 legislation. Kind of walk us through that. Yes, uh, 2013, uh, there was new monies put into the Commonwealth uh, and for the first time in 30 years. So uh, starting in 2014, when Governor McAuliffe came in office, uh, House Bill 2 worked with the uh, General Assembly, Speaker Howe, uh, and that now for the first time, we score every project in the Commonwealth, every transportation project, and the law basically says you pick the highest scored projects. Now, it does say you can use some common sense if, for instance, the, the most uh, highest scored project is something you can't afford, maybe you go to the next one right. as resources come in. 
But for the first time, we started to take uh, the politics and put governance into the transportation system. We followed that on with uh, another bill that reformed our Public-Private Partnership Act, which now gives the General Assembly a say up front when we're going to have a public-private mm -hmm. partnership, when it's in the, uh, in the citizens' best interest. And a big part of that legislation for me is that now as Secretary of Transportation, I have to stand up and, and, and certify that it is in the best interest of the, of the citizens to do this. So take that very seriously. Uh, on top of that, House Bill 1887, where we've aligned now the revenue streams uh, and uh, with the needs of the Commonwealth. And really one of the things that we weren't paying a lot of attention to uh, because of limited resources was our current road network. And mm -hmm. we were trying to add, but, um, you know, it's, it really does make a lot of sense to add a lot new unless you are making sure uh, that you're taking care of the current road network. Um, so now the new law says 45% of our construction program comes off the top and goes right in to fixing uh, these uh, projects that are not new expansion but have to be taken care of. And that 45% is what we think is going to be necessary over the next decade to start bending the curve back to where our, our, our network infrastructure, current existing, gets back up to speed. And then, of course, the remaining monies will go to new projects and they'll be scored under this process. And, Half of those monies go to the, each district, so every district in the Commonwealth will make sure they get uh, act, uh, new monies for construction each year. And then there's a part that's left at the state level where, where it gets for these statewide projects. But if you think through this now, um, any project in the Commonwealth now that receives funding is either going to be asset managed through the Virginia Department of Transportation, that is, what are the worst assets to take care of, mm -hmm. or prioritized. So I think our citizens can have a very good um, uh, confidence in, in the uh, state that we're going to be using their monies wisely. Uh, they, they voted to allow us to do, um, have more transportation monies. We should make sure they're used wisely. So that's really sort of the, the, the uh, gist behind the policy and the legislation that was passed. And hopefully um, it'll make our agencies much more efficient I mean, for the first time we delivered this year, just a few weeks ago, a six-year construction plan that's fully constrained. Every project that received funding is, is uh, funded through its construction phase. So it'll bring some certainty to both uh, the people who uh, use them, our citizens, and also Virginia Department of Transportation has to construct them with our private parties. Now they can look at it and say, this is actually going to happen. So that's really been a big focus. And proud of what the McAuliffe administration has been able to do. We've got a lot more to get done. We've got some major projects, but I think uh, we've had a good two years. So you bring a background as a businessman to this job. I do, and it's probably the first time in, in at least in recent history where, you know, I'm not an engineer, um, and I tell people I'm either neither blessed uh, nor hindered by that degree. Um, but I tend to look at it, and uh, this is one of the things I talk with, with Governor McAuliffe on, what is the problem we're trying to solve? And then put the resources to that versus starting from a building something standpoint. Um, uh, and Governor McAuliffe has been great. Uh, he has chosen governance over politics every time. He's never said, I want this project done. He said, I got this problem. Let's fix this problem. And he's left the Transportation Board, the Commonwealth Transportation Board, which I serve as, as a chair, as a Secretary of Transportation. Um, to do its work. In fact, one of the reforms was that transportation board is now independent. That mm -hmm. can only be removed for cause. And so a lot of the agencies that I deal with have uh, business-like qualities, whether it's servicing customers at DMV or construction contracts or negotiating public-private partnerships and rockets that fly and ships that sail. Um, so to bring that, I believe, is a skill set that is needed in the Secretary of Transportation um, and I'm glad the governor has allowed me the opportunity and freedom to, uh, to work with it. Now, you mentioned the word prioritization. Talk to us about that, what it means, and how it works. Well, prioritization, again, is really getting to the heart of taking politics out of which projects get built and getting the biggest bang for the citizens of the Commonwealth. So prioritization means that we score every project across the state and compare it with others. And there are six criteria that are used. Uh, First of all, congestion mitigation. 
and the law requires that in the urban areas of Northern Virginia and Hampton Roads, it has to be the highest scored metric. But we also look at economic development, safety, accessibility, um, environmental, and land planning. And those six things are scored and looked at for each project. Uh, and then we've worked over the last almost two years uh, uh, with every locality and every metropolitan planning organization in the Commonwealth and asked them to develop a template of how they wanted to be scored. In other words, an urban area would certainly want congestion mitigation to be a heavily weighted factor. But maybe in a rural area, they would choose either economic development or safety related, which mm -hmm. tends to be. So we came up with four templates, uh, that, and the localities can choose which template that they want to be scored under. Every project is submitted to the Commonwealth Transportation Board. Uh, uh, we then have an independent uh, firm that scores those projects under these metrics, and the results are given back to the board. And that's the basis the board uses now to allocate resources across the Commonwealth. Now, we recognize that every district has needs, and that's where Another piece of legislation, House Bill 1887, says yes, um, once you take care of the 45% for maintenance, the remaining 55%, half goes to the districts. Right. So every district gets new construction monies. Of course, the other amount lands at the statewide. So uh, every taxpayer in the Commonwealth knows that his district uh, is going to get some monies for new construction and maintenance every year. Now, how important is return on investment? Well, that's key, and I think that's really key not only from the return from the, from a, from the citizen standpoint, but in le leveling the playing field uh, between big and small urban and rural projects. You know, when you really get down to it, um, the issues we face in transportation are not really Democrat-Republican. Right. They tend to be urban, rural, and uh, those, you know, whether you're a commuter or where you're a transit going through something, people have divergent needs. And I remember when I was on the Commonwealth Transportation Board, uh, one of the biggest things we looked at was, well, gosh, if this road has 100,000 people using it today and this one only has 10, well, certainly we should fix this one or expand this one. Well, that may or may not be the case. What if this one costs significantly more? And, and if we don't expand this one, we don't get economic development. So what we look at is the return on investment or when we divide the benefits by the cost that gives us a very mm -hmm. good feel. For instance, certainly in these large urban areas, uh, these projects are going to probably allow more uh, throughput, but they may be much more expensive. Mm -hmm. So are we better off spending our monies here? And we, that's key to, to uh, pointing out. We still, even with the, the legislation putting new funding in, we are still significantly short of what we need to fund transportation projects in the Commonwealth. This year, under the first round of the scoring, we had $7 billion in requests and only $1.8 billion to allocate. Not complaining. Uh, uh, we, we, I'm very satisfied with the process we did, but there's a lot more needs, and we've got to make sure we're efficient. And this cost-benefit allows us to have a, an objective measure for the Transportation Board to take a look at projects when they're allocating these monies. So these low gas prices are great for tourism, but not so good for your for Department of Transportation. Yeah. What are you? You're exactly right. Um, the cornerstone of, of House Bill, I guess it was 2313 right. or 3213. I keep getting these numbers uh, <laughs> backwards sometimes. Where we put new monies in uh, was to take the cents per gallon that we were getting and make right. it at a wholesale tax per gallon. And the theory is that that percentage, as, it, as the pr gas prices right. rose, there'd be more monies coming in. Well, of course, what happened is gas prices went down. Um, and so, therefore, we're collecting less revenues than we anticipated, still more than we had before the legislation. But you're right uh, that uh, the monies that we anticipated come in haven't materialized. Now, fortunately, the legislature did put a floor in, and at the, so there is a a floor at $3.11 per gallon. I think we're significantly below that. Um, but you're right. Well, it's been great for the consumer. Uh, it has not been as good for the Commonwealth in terms of collecting uh, revenues for gas taxes. So what are some of the top projects that you've looked at? Well, certainly the one that's been in the news most recently has been Interstate 66. And I'm proud to say Governor McAuliffe reached an accommodation and a, a deal with the uh, to both the Senate and House, Republican Democrats, to move that project forward, both inside the Beltway 
and outside the Beltway. It's the first comprehensive plan we've had in almost 30 years in one of the most congested regions, not only in our state, but in, in the Commonwealth. So uh, very, very proud of that accomplishment. I think um, as all of these particular projects, it's both a good transportation solution and uh, a political solution in terms of making sure we get the multimodal, the additional transit that is needed, but also by adding additional capacity both inside and out for those who choose to stay in their vehicles. Um, so that's a very key project and um, uh, looks like now we'll be able to deliver that one over here the next few years and again be the first time in almost 30 years that there's been that type of improvement. But over and above that we have in uh, Charlottesville the Route 29 solutions where we are uh, increasing throughput through Route 29 and the surrounding roads. Um, certainly in Hampton Roads uh, expanding uh, Interstate 64 uh, on the, the peninsula uh, and the lane in each direction through Williamsburg, major project. Um, certainly in the, on the rail side of things, light rail in Virginia Beach, although we'll see where we go with that project, but that's important for us. We just announced, was it uh, Richmond City Council last right. week, bus rapid transit here in the capital was approved to go forward. So it, it's, a, it's a, a varied amount of uh, transportation projects that are going forward. Uh, and uh, I'm hopeful that uh, uh, our, our motorists will see not only the transportation benefits, but that their money's being put to good use. What about congestion in Northern Virginia in general? That, that's a huge issue. It's, uh, by far, in fact, I just saw this past year, it was ranked the most congested area in the country. So that is key to getting that uh, fixed uh, help or economic development. As we all know, we face some economic development headwinds, and transportation infrastructure has got to be a big part of that. Fortunately, uh, Congress did reach a, long, well, a, a longer-term solution right. on their transportation funding, gives us some certainty. As I mentioned, Interstate 66 um, will be done to help that congestion from east-west, but um, we'll also be expanding 395, extending the hot lanes up 95 into that quarter into D.C. Uh, I know you're from the Spotsylvania area. We're right. doing, looking at um, a fix. We have a bottleneck there. So really getting, a, we certainly have in place to help Northern Virginia, specifically with the 66 uh, project, a hot lanes network that gives our consumers and our motorists choice uh, but also frees up those who choose not to pay in, in, the, in, the, in the free lanes that will always be there. And I believe that will be a game changer for Northern Virginia so they can attract the type of uh, economic um, uh, uh, companies that they need to, to grow their economy. On top of that, we're investing in rail, the Virginia Railway Express, certainly the metro uh, in, in the D.C., Northern Virginia, Maryland area big commitments to them. Uh, we have uh, a lot to do in that area, but with the new general manager, it looks like we're heading in the right direction. So transportation is one of the more critical elements in the creation of a new Virginia economy. Yes, Governor has been clear about this. Uh, as If we're going to uh, unlock Virginia, it's got to have transportation at its core. Um, and I think if you look at the Go Virginia initiative that's yes. going forward this yes. year, it mirrors quite a bit what we've did and what we've reformed our transportation in that regions actually compete. So these regional networks that are necessary to support regional uh, commerce, uh, that's a big part of House Bill 2. It's a big part of Go Virginia. But again, it's not just about highways. It's about our port uh, and making sure that we only have access uh, to it, both on the surface transportation, but certainly through the vessels coming in. So expanding the ports necessary our aviation, making sure we're using our dollars wisely. We have uh, really two big gateways to the world in, in the Commonwealth. We're blessed with the Port of Virginia, but also we have Dulles Airport um, and making sure they are competitive to attract uh, uh, flights. The only hub status we have in the Commonwealth is at Dulles uh, and United. We want to see them expand, so making sure they're competitive. Um, so we have, not only can we get our goods in and out of here, but people in and out of here through, uh, through Dulles. So it's uh, a lot, but it does underpin, underpin our economy. Uh, what impact has the widening of the Panama Canal had on the Port of Virginia? Well, um, it's, it's, it's going to be a huge impact. 
And a lot of people think, well, because the bigger ships are coming. But, and that is part of it. But quite frankly, they've already started to arrive. Mm -hmm. But what it really does, Woody, is now this, uh, being central on the East Coast, the Port of Virginia is roughly 11,700 miles from the Asian markets, whether you go east or west. East or west. East or west. Wow. So whether it's political uncertainty in a part of the world, you now can get to the Port of Virginia uh, through either the Panama Canal with its shortening, certainly they expanded the Suez also, can get around that way. So that is take a lot of uh, carriers are now looking strategically saying, hey, we got a call on the Port of Virginia because we know we can get there. And of course with our rail networks and CSX and Norfolk Southern that serve the heartland, we've got a great opportunity but only if we invest in that, and that's why Governor McAuliffe, it's part of his budget, his bond package, is, uh, is sponsoring $350 million to expand our terminal there at Norfolk International Terminals to handle this new capacity. And it's not a matter of build it will come. It's a matter if we don't build it, they'll go somewhere else because we've got the, the deepest port on the East, Post with no, uh, East Coast with no overhead obstructions. We've got the ability to go to deeper at uh, to 55 feet working with the Army Corps. So we've got a lot of natural attributes. We need to make sure we have the land side infrastructure with the investment, and we're working to get that done. Is the port a Tier 1 or a Tier 2 facility? It is now a Tier 1 it, in terms okay. of, of uh, ha had been uh, looked at separately. Mm -hmm. but, but of course, it's not only the ports in Hampton Roads, uh, but certainly here in, in, in Richmond, we've signed a 40-year lease. I uh, just uh, had a conference, a news conference last week where we have a brand new crane. That opens us up to invest here. We're studying other intermodal ports, uh, maybe possibly in Southside Virginia. We'll take a look. We certainly have our inland port at Front Royal uh, that has now taken off. And over 20 distribution centers now have uh, uh, located around it. So the Port of Virginia, either directly or indirectly, supports one out of eight or nine jobs in this commonwealth. One out of eight. Eight or nine. So no matter whether you live in uh, northern Virginia, Hampton Roads, or what is considered the rest of Virginia, the southwest part, Port of Virginia is very important. It supports our number one export, which are agricultural business. Now we could possibly get stuff coming out of Richmond with our barge service. The inland port front row will look at others. So we really, as Governor McCullough, it, Port is a cornerstone also of our new Virginia economy. Now, most people don't know a lot about Space Virginia and Wallops Island. Talk to us about those facilities. Well, Virginia is, again, one of the few states uh, in, 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 in the country that has uh, a spaceport. Uh, and, in fact, a very important spaceport. We're one of, of uh, three uh, uh, places uh, that has a mission to supply the International Space Station. And with our partners, Orbital, um, we were able to do that. They were just uh, received an extension uh, of their contract. Uh, as you know, we had a mishap here a while back. Mm -hmm. That's behind us now. It's been, uh, pad has been restored. We've got uh, commitment with NASA. Actually, we're better than ever. So space uh, in Virginia has got a very bright future. Uh, we should be uh, launching again sometime uh, later this summer, in fact, resuming uh, flights to the space station. Um, so uh, very glad to be a part of that. And again, the jobs and economic activity that will come off of that, really important to Virginia's new economy. These are high-tech jobs uh, that uh, will be supported not just on the, Del uh, the um, uh, Virginia uh, Eastern Shore, uh, but also orbitals based in the Dulles area, Northern Virginia. So again, uh, something that uh, we're proud to invest in, be a part of, uh, being part of this technology and important uh, part of the space program. How's the P3 process working? Uh, we're getting ready to find out. Uh, uh, we're doing a major one as, uh, with Interstate 66 outside the Beltway. As I mentioned before, that process has been reformed. Um, and uh, we now look at, and you would have thought maybe this is what we should have been doing before, but from a business background, we now look at what it would cost the Commonwealth of Virginia to build the road with its own resources. And that's the point we start from negotiating with our private parties. So I can stand up and say, if you meet our term sheet, I can confidently tell the citizens of Virginia we got a better deal than if we did it ourselves. And that's something different than we haven't done before. But that's what we'll be doing here. Uh, we're in a procurement with uh, Interstate 66. Currently have three concessionaires that say they can beat our term sheet. We should know by this uh, December, or excuse me, September. 
uh, and I'm confident that we'll get a good deal for the uh, for the uh, for our taxpayers. Uh, but I'm very look. If we're going to deliver our transportation program in the Commonwealth, we're going to need public-private partnerships. They're not the answer for every project, but they are a significant procurement tool. And with limited resources, they have got to be a part of our uh, a part of our process. Now, what about tolling in general? People don't like tolling for some reason. Um, yes, and I think that's really twofold. Uh, number one, because sometimes you hear, "Well, I pay taxes, and why should I toll again?" I get that, but as we know, we, we have not collected enough taxes to do all the needs. But also, I think it's because, quite frankly, uh, particularly in Hampton Roads, we haven't um, uh, introduced tolling correctly. It's been fixed tolls where we actually took away capacity and charged the toll before we, we actually had the benefits of it. So that's why we're sponsoring legislation this year, working with the House and Senate to our, so our taxpayers and, and toll payers know where this ends and putting some parameters around that. You should not pay a toll without having a free alternative. Uh, in other words, if you're going to toll the road, you got to make sure you have the same free alternative and give people a choice. And I think you combine the way it was introduced in Hampton Roads and quite frankly the concession there there had some issues and I can understand why people aren't. But we shouldn't look, or not happy with it, but we shouldn't look as tolling as simply a revenue generation. It should be used as, trans, uh, as, as transportation uh, metric to help us monitor traffic and give people choices. And I think that's if we work through that, uh, it's going to take us some time, but people will understand the benefit of tolling. But I agree, it shouldn't just be added on, take away capacity and say, pay us for something that I, don't, I can already use today for free. Now, dynamic tolling is used on 95 and 495. That's correct. In Northern Virginia, we, so we often call them hot lanes, um, but that uh, dynamic tolling, instead of having a, a fixed charge, it says we're going to guarantee you a, 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 a speed of ride. In other words, if you want to use this, we're going to guarantee you 45, 55 miles an hour. And the toll is based on uh, how fast that traffic is moving. So the more people that use it, it slows it down, the toll goes up. But what are you right? The key there, it's always a choice. If you don't want to use it, you don't have to. And we've also seen that for every person that we get that makes that choice, it helps those who choose to stay in the free lanes. In fact, uh, on 95, in the first year of operation, it's freed up over 20% capacity. So it helps both parties, those that choose to pay and those that don't choose to pay. And I think that's key to a tolling policy to having choice, and that's why the McAuliffe administration favors that type of policy over just fixed tolling without new capacity. Great. Well, thank you for being with us today, Secretary of Transportation, Aubrey Lane. Thank you for having me. Thank you for watching this special edition of Cable Reports brought to you by the Virginia Cable Telecommunications Association. Until next time, I'm Woody Evans. Mm-hmm.